Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy, and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team, who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name's Nesha Nikolic, and I'm so excited to be bringing to you again, Dr. Stephen C. Hayes, uh, incredible human being, incredible psychologist, researcher, someone I admire so immensely. And it's been a privilege to talk to him today for almost two hours, and we cover everything from process-based therapy and, and the paradigm shift around that, psychiatric medication, questioning mental health as a disease model, uh, looking at mental health status around the world and, and even the use of psychedelics. Incredible interview today. Quite excited to be bringing this to you because it was uh, profound for me in terms of looking at the future and also looking at my practice, even though I've been practicing acceptance and commitment therapy from you know day dot and, and something that really resonates for me. And I feel this you know, conversation alone is going to really uh, ask something a little bit more from me in a nuanced perspective in terms of how I approach therapy. So I hope you enjoy as much as I did talking to Steve. Steve Hayes, a big thank you for your generosity and coming back on the show on Better Thinking today. It's great to be back here with you again. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to it. Look, I'm so excited. I've got so many questions that I want to ask, ranging from, you know, that obviously the process-based therapy that's uh, uh, or, 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 or you know approach that is is coming to light and being so important. But uh, I think there's some other space that I want to maybe touch on to start with, if that's okay. Uh, sure. I wanted to get a little bit of your take on uh, uh, the role of psychiatric medication in 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 psychology as a, as a whole i know that here in australia you know over the course of you know certainly the last 10 uh, 15 years there's been a really big promotion um within or understanding within the community of of you know if someone's not feeling well we tend to lean straight towards you know a pharmacotherapy type of approach because we're gp um you know, uh, orientated. So everyone goes to their GP to get referred to their specialists and, and they, in, in many ways, you know, uh, doing their best in that space. So I thought I'd take a, you know, a starting point there and ask you about your thoughts about the role and, and um, you know, how that ends up playing out in your, in your experience. It's a difficult issue. There's, uh, you know, a whole lot of Things coming together there. It's a $1.4 trillion industry. Obviously, they have an interest uh, in that. Um, the sales keep going up, but the uh, mental health suffering uh, keeps going up too, which is makes you wonder. And you really want good science. You want it not to be contaminated just by uh, commercial uh, interests. There's no uh, doubt that uh, at the right time and place for the right uh, circumstance, it can be of some help. But there's some things that weren't really evident that we're really looking at carefully at the beginning that we were looking at intensively now. And those include your body reacts to perturbation of your natural homeostasis. I mean, we evolved for a certain range of functions and our body didn't evolve for this level of serotonin, for example. If you start using SSRIs, you're exposing your body to something that has never existed on the planet before. And it's not that the body's not tracking it, it starts down-regulating serotonin within days of taking the medications. And some of that down-regulation turns out now, we know, can be very long-lasting. So you get what's called opponent process effects. We knew that with antipsychotics, so-called, um, with movement disorders from the perturbation of uh, dopamine, 
It looks like that's true now with serotonin, with very long-lasting sexual side effects and uh, what maybe looks like a, um, a sensitive and an ease with which you can relapse. There was a recent meta-analysis looking at the serotonin hypothesis in terms of maybe depression comes from that, concluding, as others have, there's really no evidence at all that people go, uh, enter into depression because they have a problem with serotonin, but they exit depression if they're in high dosage, long-term use of uh, SSRIs with very long-lasting, odd nervous systems that in fact are lower in serotonin than they were when they began and maybe permanently so. And you add to that the fact that withdrawal symptoms often look like relapse. And if you look at the training that physicians and so forth get, uh, these are all mixed together. They're told, oh, it's very uncommon and it's mild. No, when you ask people directly, it's more than half the people and, and people themselves rated as severe. So here we have a system where you can kind of enter in, but it's hard to leave because of these opponent process effects and because of the side effects of being um, of, of withdrawal looking like relapse and, and long-term side effects. Uh, you know, you now have black box warnings. Warning, if you use these antidepressants, you may become suicidal. And you go like, what? What? Did I, did I hear that? Did play that back again. And how that happened, you know, when the data came out originally from Europe and, and then the Freedom of Information Act and so forth forced out the data. So we really have to be wiser. Don't set your hair on fire and say, you know, no, 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 no to psychoactive medications of all kinds. No, that's not the solution. The solution has to be lower dosage, shorter term use, honest rationales. Don't say you may have a brain disease when you don't have the data for that. And giving rationales that uplift and integrate the integration of the use of these medications with, with uh, psychosocial interventions that have a vast amount of support saying they can do as well as or better without the side effects and without the long-term problems. Now, the problem is, it is not just the medications. It's the story we tell about normative categories called syndromes predicting your future. And even children now will, and young adults will say what they have, and sometimes it's quite a long list, uh, comes right out of a book. And here's the problem. Once you climb into that, most people think when they hear you have a disorder, they hear, I need to be on medications. And in North America, for example, 60% of the people who get a diagnosis only get medications with no psychosocial help whatsoever. 30% get some help, but often with rationales that make that help not central and the most important, which long-term it is. And we're, we're about to enter into single digits of individuals who get evidence-based psychotherapy. And when you get psychotherapy, it's often, often not evidence-based. Now you put that all together and you say you've got a, a cultural, a worldwide kind of a health train wreck and I can't help but open my eyes wide and look at the world and say, we have a worldwide train wreck. Yeah, I saw a story recently that one out of three teenagers in the UK are on antidepressants. In the United States of America, one out of four women last year are on antidepressants. Well, there's no meta-analysis saying that's a good idea. They say with severe depression, short-term use linked to an honest rationale and good psychosocial interventions can be helpful. But that's not the same as the dump and run of a quick script given to one out of four women entering into a healthcare system. That's insanity. It's insanity. And we'll pay. We are paying the price. And because uh, some of these are hard to then taper and withdraw from and so forth, uh, you know, it's like many of the medications, it's not the only ones where they didn't do the long-term follow-up side effect profiles and so forth. People are treated as a so-called stage four, you have to make complaints and eventually these things are seen, but sometimes too late. And so I worry about where we are as a human community. 
And every place where the system has gone and those numbers have gone way up, the outcomes haven't got better. They got worse. Mm. So I'm sorry. I mean, that's, I'm, I've done randomized trials teaching clinicians to not be so restrictive about using medications when it's needed. I, I am not a hair on fire anti-medication person, but good science and uh, good uh, uh, prescription practices that fit the needs of the individual and that has an honest conversation with people. Don't be telling people they have diabetes because they have depression. It's just a different form. It, not that you have diabetes, but they say, just like diabetes, you have to be managed forever. No, it's not just like diabetes. There's no biomarker. There's no biomarker. You can't say it's like diabetes. That's that's a lie. And so why are we lying to people? So they'll keep using their medications. Nah, stop lying to people. How about stage one? And then let's see what is the best and be more open and follow the good science. Sorry for the long answer, but it's a difficult issue, isn't it? Wow. No, I think, uh, and I uh, appreciate your answer. I know that uh, uh, another uh, person that I uh, uh, have found refreshing in this space because they are very analytical and, and research driven is Joanna Moncrief, you know, who's yeah. also done a meta analysis looking at the the effects of you know long-term use versus as you say a shorter term use with other supportive interventions psychosocial uh, that you know has uh, you know improved um, uh, you know rates in in terms of you know better outcomes you know fewer hospitalizations fewer visits to the gp you know and, and the like and and you know that's over you know a longer term period looking at a you know, matter meta analyses uh, you know which which you know, obviously is the gold standard to, to, to look at these things. No, these long-term studies are needed. What happened is that the uh, community standards of care settled so early, and we're talking about decades ago, that the studies weren't even done and weren't even allowed to be done. It was considered to be unethical to do them because you're going to have to use as a control group people who aren't following the community standards, but the community standards settled too fast. And I have to say, with a very large for-profit industry behind the scenes, only too happy to have them settle fast. But now we're paying the piper, but also now we're getting some much better science. And so let's really look carefully of how do we use this? It takes better care management. You're going to have to have to have tapering programs, for example. You're going to have to really have a psychosocial a program that is evidence-based and that fits hand in glove with what you're doing on the medication side. Don't just give people a, a number to call or, or, or a referral and you don't follow up and see are they actually getting you know, face-to-face -face with a, a psychotherapist who knows what you're doing and will work with you. And now, you know, with the loads we put on our healthcare system and our physicians, you know, we have to feel a little bit uh, uh, as though that's, uh, uh, you know, understandable, but it's not good enough for a bad system to be understandable. Mm -hmm. We have to have a, a system that's good enough that people's lives can be served. And what we're doing right now is not that. Steve, do you mind if we just spend a moment to talk about this concept, you know, theory of there being a chemical imbalance you know I'm, I'm still surprised that you know even some of my colleagues you know where where scientist practitioners uh have not looked into this and and you know uh have been brought up if you will with an understanding of a chemical imbalance existing yet there is no biomarker but i'd love to hear your your views on it because you know it's always fascinated me where you know we give a out some medication but we haven't done any testing to say at what dose, you know, we're not doing blood tests. We're not doing, uh, you know, any, any uh, pathology that, that goes out and supports and recommends. And even when we're changing medications, it, it just seems to go round and round. The, the, the variability um, that, that that's in the industry is, is mind boggling. Um, you, know, you could see 10 different uh, prescribers and they'll give you 10 different things, you know, like where's the, where's the evidence, but I'd love to hear your, your, your views on this. 
Yeah, I agree. And then, you know, you get into polypharmacy and then you get into medications to man manage the side effects of the medications. And, you know, I think, you know, if you're going to speak about this that way, then you need the biomarkers that allow you to say individual by individual, what is the imbalance that they have? There are such things as imbalances like that that exists in physical disease of a wide variety. But that does not mean that because people have mental health struggles that you can biomedicalize it and then say, and therefore there must be one, and then start telling the public that it means that there is one with little weasel world words to stay on the right side of the law. In the US of A, we're unwise enough that you can have direct to consumer advertising. And the word they use is may. You may have a chemical imbalance. I may have monkeys flying out of my ear. I mean, you can say anything after that may word. You're not held to account. I'm not saying you do. Well, you can't because there's not evidence that you do and you have no measures of and biomarkers. Don't believe me. Go look at the American Psychiatric Association DSM-5 work group in which they say there are no real sensitive and specific biomarkers for any of the psychiatric syndromes in this book. So, okay, if you if that's the situation, the language of chemical imbalance is a theory that scientists can chase. I do wonder how many decades and how many billions should be spent on it, but I'm not the only one. You know, uh, there's a uh, big funders such as NIMH that has really begun beginning to wonder about that same question. But but I think it goes back to something, and this is a disturbing thing that's in the process-based therapy. It goes back to the idea that human difference should be viewed in these large chunks of normative categories. And when you see differences be pe between people in these chunks, in this case, psychiatric syndromes, that you should assume that there's some sort of biological process behind it. You know, and that started with the individual differences movement in psychology, and it was applied to aptitude, intelligence, uh, uh, you know, learning abilities, traits of all kinds, and the psychiatric diagnosis came right out of that. You know, nature and nurture. Who first said that on the planet? That's Galton, Francis Galton, who did what? Who invented the bell curve and standard deviations. And who did what? Who created the science of individual differences that was never about individuals, it was about differences. And the problem is, is that that way of thinking doesn't tell you what to do about the individual. And it doesn't tell you what the source of those individual, of those differences are. It's just a guess. You say, oh, it's genetic, which of course Galton did. But do remember, Galton was the father of what field? Uh, fingerprinting. No, that's true. That's not the one I'm thinking of. Uh, could it be eugenics? Ding, 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 ding. You get the prize. And in fact, his development of those models, not just him, Carl Pearson, eugenicist. R.A. Fisher, eugenicist. Frank Yates, eugenicist. I mean, you do Pearson's R. You do Fisher's Z if you're a scientist, right? You're doing bell curves and standard deviations. You're doing the Yates correction on a chi-square. Friends, these tools were developed in order to sort people into those who had, should have children and those who don't. And the idea was behind it was differences between people are genetic. And that they predict the future of people because of that. It's not true. Both those statements are, are untrue. And they formed a kind of a larger gestalt. I mean, the word normal was hardly ever said in the English language until the Civil War. And then eugenics drove it up to a really high level of use. It's falling off now because young people have this computer in their pocket where normal no longer a prize. You can have it your way. You don't have to be in the norm. And suddenly we've got different pronouns. We've got, you know, none of the above is the fastest growing religious group. We've got uh, people with their individual music streams. I and mean, we've fractionated this. And 
I think the culture is going to turn on those of us who try to shove people into cubby holes and say, just stay in there, you know, whether it's your sexual orientation or your religion or anything else. And so it's part of a larger problem in thought that is 150 years old. It's everywhere in our culture. And it was driven by racism and classism and by, I have to say, bad statistics. Why do I say that? Because where you are on a bell curve doesn't predict your individual human trajectory. And uh, we may get into that conversation because I've discovered this in my process-based therapy journey that statistical physics has known for a hundred years that you can't predict the trajectory of elements from a collection of elements at a given point in time. We're just waking up to that in the behavioral and uh, um, uh, psychological sciences. So if you think that a diagnosis predicts your future, which people do, they say, I have, and it sounds destigmatizing, but wait a minute, because immediately their future is foreshortened. Mm -hmm. Their family mm -hmm. treats them differently. That doesn't mean, look to me like real destigmatization. Real destigmatization looks to me like empowerment. And when you've foreshortened your future and the family around you expects less of you, because after all, you have a brain disease, because somebody told you that's what the category means, this is not good for human empowerment. And so are we in the empowerment business or in the sorting people into categories business? We've got to make this decision as therapists, I think. And so there's a role for the DSM and the rest. But boy, our major focus has to be on the people that we're serving. And that means the individuals, the couples, the families that are in front of us. It doesn't mean the conceptual category that's in our head and that we put on people like some sort of ill-fitting suit that barely describes a tiny proportion of what their life is about and, and yet insists that they live inside that category, maybe for the rest of their life. It's almost like there's so much uh, energy being put into trying to remove stigma and saying going and seeing a psychologist is okay it's you know it's it's okay to have a mental illness it, it, it's almost driving us to categories so rather than saying it's okay to be human and there are challenges in life and so we go through tough times and you know they're the times where being connected with others you know and looking at your surroundings and and what's what you know who and what's important to you that campaign is nowhere to be found uh, the we we have a quick campaign with you know a catch line which goes out and says we're removing stigma you know for for seeing a psychologist i know the australian government at the moment and this isn't a uh, a, uh, um, a crack at the government by, by any means because I think they're well-intentioned, um, but they're just putting more money into uh, promoting you know, mental health awareness. And, and it's like everyone knows this. Let's put the money elsewhere. You know, let's, let's have a, oh, I, uh, an education yeah. campaign, not an awareness campaign about what you can do. I agree. Here's, here's the problem, I think, with the destigmatization programs. One is they're very often not tested scientifically. I really have a worry about that. Uh, I was on NIDA Council, the group that decides the National Institute of Drug Abuse, where that billion dollars would be spent. And a friend and a colleague who I really respect, Alan Leshner, who went on to lead the American Association for the Advancement of Science, but at the time was the head of NIDA, uh, was the one who decided he was going to have this campaign on destigmatizing and is sort of this is drugs this is your brain on drugs all these kinds of things came out of alan's work but part of it was uh, addiction as a brain disease and we didn't have good uh, data that talking that way was truly dis destigmatizing i did some implicit cognition work around these different terms and one of the most de one of the most stigmatizing and frightening words i could come up with was brain disease I mean, it's frightening to people. You want to have a brain disease? Really? Do you think that's destigmatizing? Really? No, what you mean is you stop blaming the person. Okay. Okay, I get that. But here's the problem. Inside the system, as we've been thinking about it, 
we have these diagnosable mental illnesses, these kind of latent diseases that we've reified into actual things. Why? Because we hope then we can figure out what the functional processes are, what the diseases are, but we somehow never get there. No psychiatric diseases have ever emerged in the history of syndromal diagnosis, never happened. And we can talk about what a disease is, a syndrome is, if we need to do that. But, you know, we have these, uh, these uh, normative uh, categories that are supposed to be destigmatizing, and about one out of five people probably has one. Four out of five at a given moment in time probably doesn't. And so destigmatizing means um, be kind to the one out of four if you're in the four out of five. And don't beat yourself up per personally too much if you're the one out of five. Here's what's wrong about that. And boy, did we see it over the COVID era. Mental health is not one out of five. It's five out of five. It would be like saying, oh, I'm so sorry. You're, you're physically weak, you know. So, uh, you know, maybe you have to exercise. Oh, you poor thing. No, exercise is something. Diet, sleep, exercise. That's a five out of five issue. It's not a one out of five issue. We're used to that in physical health. You go to mental health, you know, they say the word health, but what they mean is the absence of disease and what they mean by disease or syndromes, which are not diseases. And there we are to either be kind to yourself or have, you know, some pity for the people who are on the one out of five. That's not real destigmatization. Real destigmatization would look like this is a life task for all of us. This is part of our life journey to learn how to be psychologically resilient and healthy. And we're all going to have problems when we get challenged and sometimes severely. And by the way, you know, 98% of the human population even admits to suicidal thoughts and the other 2% are lying. So instead of thinking of yourself as sort of specially grand because you don't have a disorder or you know, I'm sorry, but I have one. If you do have a disorder, let's let go of the have a disorder language and adopt a language of what am I doing right now to foster my mental health, my social wellness, my behavioral health in terms of flexibility and endurance and uh, the capacity to rise to change. Take some of the metaphors that were well established in the culture with Fit with physical things where we, we want to be strong, we want to be flexible, we want to have good endurance. Move that over. And in team sports, we want to be a good team player. Move that over into the psychological side. And you'd say, we want to be strong, we want to have endurance, we want to have flexibility, and you want to be a good team player in the sense of relationships working and, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, creating uh, a, a kinder and gentle and more connected and attached world. We can do that. And here's the exciting thing I, I want to share with you because uh, it's a, one of the it's the last publication I've put out, but it was only three weeks ago or something like that. I published a lot, but I think it's maybe one of the most important things I've ever done. Which is, we spent three years looking at every randomized trial that was ever done in the history of the world for any psychosocial intervention focused on mental health, and the only requirement was a randomized trial. And it had to have treatment as usual or no treatment as a comparison. Why? Because we didn't want to look just as what worked. We wanted to look at the studies that did a proper mediational analysis so that they knew what was the functionally important pathways to that outcome. And it's there are things you can say about mediational analysis. I have problems with it, uh, but I'm not going to go into that. There were geeky scientific statistical problems. But it's the best we got. And it's a lot better than this correlational analysis and a hundred times better than just outcomes, meaning your theories are right. No, I mean, your theories can be absolute nonsense, but what you actually do in methods are helpful. So we looked at 55, we had no idea what we were getting into. It turns out we took three years and 50 people to do this. And we looked at 55,000 studies and we read them all twice and we came up with um, about 700 findings that were done properly. And then we looked at the ones that were replicated, where the, the process of change was measured using a measure that was 
also successful as a mediator in some other studies somewhere else at least once. So none, no one and duns because often they looked like people were p hacking. You know, they were just sure, searching sure. through all kinds of combinations till something worked. You know, one item from here, one item from there. And, and good I'm, science I'm, requires replication. Yeah, yeah, you got to replicate it. Well, we ended up with seventy three measures of two hundred and eighty one studies. Oh, I just found a mistake in the spreadsheet today. Maybe it's 280. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I can sit here and tell you what nobody else could until this moment, which is I know what the most successful, frequent, and commonly found significant mediators, functionally important pathways of change. Just think of it that way. The way to get from here to there, think of it that way, in psychosocial interventions of any kind um, done in a randomized trial focused on mental health. So drum roll, please. Plays psychological, the flexibility and, psychological flexibility and mindfulness account for 45% of all the findings. If you add self-compassion, behavioral activation, anxiety, sensitivity, concepts that are really close to the core of psychological flexibility, if you know that work, it goes up to 55%. If you look at the, the rest, you have a chunk of uh, social support, therapeutic alliance, things like that. You've got a chunk of diet, sleep, exercise, brain circuits, things like that. So you've got the biophysiological level, the social cultural level. And then within psychology, what I'm saying, big chunks, well, cognitive flexibility is real important, reappraisal. But it looks like it's really a matter of flexibility. It doesn't just don't think this, think that. It's something more like think flexibly, take the ones that are helpful. Uh, Self-efficacy. Believe in yourself. You can do something. Focus on what's important to you and, and mobilize your behavioral resources. Well, that kind of sounds to me like psychological flexibility as an act person. But I didn't want to say that it was because it sounds like I'm you know, going to force everybody into that model. But in fact, it is a, a pretty healthy form, I think, of values-based uh, focus with behavioral flexibility to get things done, avoiding procrastination and the other kind of things that would slow you down. If you allow me to do things like that, you know, like self-efficacy is really kind of a behavioral commitment and I can do it type strategy, or reappraisal is really kind of a think flexibly and broadly and do what works, now it gets up to about 80%. Uh, 80% with what? If you know how to across issues of emotion, cognition, attention, sense of self, motivation, and behavior, if you can engage in healthy variation, notify, notice the winners and losers, stay with the winners, and fit it to context, you're going to do a lot better in your life. And not just in mental health, turns out those same processes will extend to behavioral health and they'll extend to performance and they'll extend to social wellness. So maybe we're not that complicated. Maybe there's only so many ways to get screwed up and maybe it's a lot easier that's one in all those syndromes and sun syndromes that the book itself says doesn't tell you what to do. And the DSM has language in there saying this doesn't tell you what treatment to give. So okay, how about what you need, what I need, what each individual needs? And so that's where I think we need to go. And that's what the process-based therapy or process-based approach, really, it's not a new form of therapy. It's a new way of thinking about therapy takes you, which is way more individualistic, way more focused on strengths, and way more tailored and fit to, to the needs and purposes of the individual. And wouldn't that be cool? If we could have a diagnostic system that says, for you, this is what you're doing that is creating problems, but if you did this, it would really help. In physical medicine, we're trying to do that, we call it personalized medicine. You know, and if you have a cancer diagnosis, you may not want one size fits all cancer treatment. You know, when my brother, he gave me permission to say this, and he got prostate cancer several years ago. He's a physician, retired now. He went to the Mayo Clinic. He went to the University of California, San Francisco. Why? Because they have the individualized tests that can tell you in great specificity a lot about that specific tumor, 
his specific body and specific treatments that might serve him well. Why don't we have something like that mm. in uh, psychotherapy and, and psychiatric problems? Well, because we've been thinking in terms of top-down normative categories, blurring people into the errors terms instead of really modeling the individual human life that you have in front of you and trying to understand what empowers or disempowers them given their purposes. And I think we can do a lot better than what, uh, than fulfilling Galton's eugenic dreams. Steve, can you talk us through, thank you for, 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 for that. Can you talk us through this shift towards uh, uh, how we're looking at therapy is process based you know how where is this shift come from for from you um from from others uh i know that uh you know you've, you've got uh, colleagues that i've spoken with as well you know even in within the cbt world that are you know looking at the the, the exact same things that there's a there's a there's an alignment or a realignment i suppose if that's the correct terminology where where we're coming together with an understanding around this process base so maybe you can talk us through this a little bit so that i can understand and obviously the listeners you know yeah. a bit more deeper a bit more uh, nuanced well, what process does is it answers the why question at the level of the individual processes are just the, the actual whys that add to the what's. Uh, you know, you know what the suffering looks like, signs and symptoms or what's, right? And you can organize cluster the what's. Uh, those are called syndromes. Why would you do that? Because you hope you find the why. You hope you find the etiology, the course, and the response to treatment. That's the game. That's what syndromes are for. But sometimes when things are quite complex, there are some phenomena, it depends on what they are. Cancer is a good example, where the actual survival rates of cancer weren't helped by saying whether the lesion had this shape or that shape or that color or the other color. It wasn't until they finally gave up on botanizing, just looking at the what's, and went into the lab and started asking why and discovered oncogenes and now epigenetic regulation of uh, unrestricted cell growth and so forth, that they came up with medications and treatments that really make it much more likely that you'll live rather than die if you have cancer in area after area of cancer. Where are the great steps forward in psychiatry and psychology? Where are the, how come, where are the big jumps forward in effect sizes? They're absent. Our effect sizes aren't going up. They're, they've tailored off, flattened out. And I think it's because we need to go into a more personalized approach. When that strategy fails, it's because many different things can produce things that look the same, or the same thing can produce things that look different. When that happens, you need to understand the why. And so you can't just go by superficial similarity to topographies, what it looks like or what people say, to know what the underlying process is. But the science matured. Now we started with process, the early behavior therapists, the early evidence-based therapists of the modern variety. I mean, of another sort, Maslow and the rest were evidence-based. I don't want to you know, blast a whole tradition. I was a Maslow person before I was a behaviorist. But in the way we normally mean evidence-based, the behavior therapists, let's be honest, were the first real push towards evidence-based therapy. And what were they? They were the process to procedure to outcome people. Reinforcement, stimulus control, classical conditioning. Why didn't we stay there? Because the concepts were too limited. Animal learning doesn't give you what you and I are doing right now. Where's the symbolic learning, relational learning? Where's human thought? It's not in there. Now, 50, 60 years later, we know a lot, and we know a lot about how to put it in there. And we've tried the, let's focus on the what, in, in hopes it'll give us the why. We've tried that. We gave it four or five years, four or five decades, and many, many billions of dollars. And it hasn't given us the results. It's given us even problems. We started off to Discovering those. I mean, some benefits inside the medications, but many problems, etc. So let's go back to the future, but now with a new set of concepts and with a sensitivity to how you even measure 
and analyze process. And the really exciting thing that I'm realizing, and it took five or six years of this process-based approach before I discovered it, is I've realized that the early behavioral folks were right in another way. Mostly they were ideographic people. And you take a concept like reinforcement. That was, concept was done with high density examination of a few animals. And then replicated and replicated and replicated and replicated and replicated. And eventually you say, okay, it's a nomothetic principle, but you still have to know what are the reinforcers and what conditions, why for this animal, for this behavior, blah, 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 blah. You had to fit it, the particular behavior, the particular animal, et cetera. That's exactly the kind of research that we now need to do. Why? Well, Here's the, exa uh, the example I was used, but I can show you some actual data that would show it. Uh, when I'm giving this talk, I'll, I'll put a, a picture of a building in front of people and I'll say, you have to get to the other side. There's an alley to the left. There's an alley to the right. There's glass doorways in the front and the picture shows it. I said, unfortunately, if you open that glass door in the front, it has another glass door behind it, a little vestibule, and it's locked. You can't walk straight ahead. But there's a door to the left that goes to the basement. There's a door to the right that goes to the to the roof. And you can go down the fire escape or through the basement and up the stairs. So now you've got left, right, up or down. If people equally did that, those are all processes. A process just means a procession, a parade, a sequence. The steps you'd take to get from here to there, from the front to the back, there's steps you have to take. And they can be left, right, up or down. That's it. You average it all, here's what group statistics will tell you. Run really fast through the glass door that's locked. No, you're just going to get a bloody nose that way. You're not going to get to the other side. So we started looking. How many individuals fit the norms that come from those bell curves that Galton said told us how human lives unfold so much that he could say, you know, that... Uh, you know, some people shouldn't be allowed to have children, but some people should. And we have now studies where we've looked at big randomized trials where no one does what the group results show. No one. Want an example everyone can understand? Please. Easy one. All the people listening to now, sit down and type on your computer as fast as you can. Send me the list of the words you typed. I'll count up the number of mistakes you made. Time it so I can know how fast you typed. I can guarantee you faster typists make fewer errors per correct word than slow punt and peck typists. Do you doubt it? No, you don't doubt it. Faster typists will be more expert. And on average, no matter what podcast I'm on, with that challenge, it'll always show that when you type faster, you make fewer errors. But every single person listening to me now, without exception, makes more errors when they type faster. It's a different level of analysis. And we've been deluded by the underlying statistics and we've missed it for 150 years. And as I mentioned, I think the statistical physics figured it out, proposed it in the 1880s, was proven in the 1930s. And here we are, the people who should know better. So process-based work is exploding because we're ready. We're frustrated with the alternative. We have enough data as what the processes are. I just told you a big, gigantic systematic review. We know a lot about now the processes of emotion, cognition, motivation, and so on. We're not just doing, you know, people are like pigeons. And we now have analytic methods that allow us to look at those questions in powerful and proper statistical ways that will allow clinicians to measure, model, and predict at the level of the individual in which no human being will need to be an error term to be part of an evidence-based approach Every voice matters. Every client needs to be heard. Clinicians have always known that. And that's why they suspected the science is bull, because they see those smooth curves. And then what, what they show in the what they see in the clinic is chaos. They see people going up and down and sideways and all kinds of well, grow up. That's the actual reality of human life. It's not these smooth averages. And so 
all of those things have come together to create what I think is a spectacular moment here where the clinicians and the scientists can get together in a new way that doesn't shame the clinicians and saying, you got to listen to us where when you listen to them, it doesn't fit. You know, I don't see people with those simple syndromes. I see people with three or four. And by the way, they, week by week, it seems like it's, you know, a new a crisis of the week. And it's no, because that's right. The individual should be the thing that is never turned into an error term. You wanted to have an error term collecting folks into groups. That's an error term. And so we we can we can do that upside down statistics that and and theory and concepts. I can give you some. I might have just did a rant, but I can give you something that's happened really recently that just kind of has shocked us. Please. I hope Joe Sorochi there in the Australian Catholic University found this, and I hope he's not mad at me for talking about it out loud. But I was just so gobsmacked when I saw it. We've started to now do these statistics where we get high density measures over time, which yeah sounds onerous. But if you if you've got a clinical practice, you're doing that already because you saw your client last week and you see him this week and you see him this week, and they tell you what's going on, and you're putting it into a sequence. It's you're not pushing the reset button and it's brand new this week. You look at what what's been happening over the course of therapy, right? Well, you can do that with measures and statistics. You can do that. We usually don't, but you can. So we start looking at the questions, and here's one. Everybody knows that if you're more self-compassionate, you're more compassionate towards others. It's a correlation about 0.35. Self-compassion is good for people. It's a good process. And, uh, you know, I'm not going after Christine Neff. I mean, this is very close to emotional acceptance and things that are real close to my model. They correlate 0.7 or something at the group level. And you start looking within individuals. For three out of five people, it's true. Kinder to yourself, kinder towards others, within the person. One out of five didn't seem like it related much. And then there's the one where you go, oh, no. One out of five, the kinder they are to themselves, the meaner they are to others. Have you not met people like that? Mm. It's time for my self-care. You take care of the kids. I'm going to go do a bubble bath, you know, like, without any consideration about, have you not seen that? It's there Absolutely. in the modern world. Absolutely. We have selfish mindfulness. We have selfish self-compassion. We have selfish acceptance. We have selfish values. You know, we've been able to, you know, produce things that probably never existed in the world without our help. Thank you very much. But, uh, you know, selfish <laughs> mindfulness. You know, a good teacher would have whacked you over the head with a stick. You know? <laughs> but I guess we can't do that in psychotherapy. So um, here, here's where, but then you say, wow, that's so weird. And then you see, these are the folks for whom self-compassion also doesn't go with quality of life. It's not really lifting them up. That kind of self-care is not really what you want. And it also doesn't go with better relationships. Well, duh, you think about it. But we we have some data now looking at the quality of the relationships that happen. So how are we going to ameliorate that? Well, dear clinician, do not be thinking that an ACT protocol or a self-compassion protocol or a mindfulness protocol is a one-size-fits-all solution to the world. You need to look at the needs and, and processes of the individual. And if this particular individual, when you do self-compassion, starts doing that dark, dark turn I just talked about, which you only see if you measure it and look for it within the person over time, you're going to have to come in and do some corrective things or you haven't actually helped them. You've hurt them, even if they get more self-compassionate. Mm -hmm. And you kind of know it clinically, but the science should be casting a bright light on it and giving you the easy tools to detect when it's happening early or even before you start intervention, even better, so that you can come in with exactly what's needed for this person to bump them forward. And I'm so excited about where we're going with a process-based approach because it, isn't, it ain't just me and Stefan Hoffman and Joe Sorochi and a small band. It's, I think we're on the cusp of something that's going to change the world. 
and self from self help to psychotherapy it's going to be high density measures linked to processes of change that give you the information that will lead you to the kernels the bumps the small steps that are tailored to you and your goal and that can be corrected if we get them wrong and it's not going to look like one size fits all big gigantic books shoved into cubby holes where all the people within a disorder have been forced in and threatened with their life if they ever leave i mean time for that to end it it's 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 a hard sell for for humans you know clinicians i i, I believe because it really requires a nuanced understanding and, and and that means sustained mental attention you know which we're all avoidant of maybe not all that's the wrong terminology but many of us are, are avoidant of it also makes us vulnerable you know it, it i have to put you know with, with 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 this insight i have to put my hand up in the air and say i got it wrong you know and and and, and, and that's frightening for for us as clinicians, as, as humans, to say, you know, you know, you know, even though I can try and you know maneuver it and say, well, you know, it was my best, you know, uh, work at the time with what I knew, so and so. But uh, it's it's a paradigm shift, right? Yeah. Of, of 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 saying I need to spend more time in in understanding, you know, for example. What is the symbolism of this act for this person in this context? And and and, and you know uh, that when I'm pushed by you know a third party that's asking me to write a report that is going back into the categories, I'm writing a personalised uh, description of this individual um, based on their character, their being, their personality, the symbolism that they've put forward, the representations of of, of their language and how they see the world. You know, it's it, it's uh, uh, maybe when I say it, a hard it's, uh, slow, it's, it, it's a vulnerable it sound, position that we need to start from, I feel. It does sound uh, daunting, and it personally is true that um, everyone was wrong to a degree, <laughs> uh, including yours truly. Um, and so then that's a little hard. But here's the great things we have going for it. I haven't met many clinicians who didn't start with an energy yeah. that was a little bit more like curiosity and compassion and concern about humanity, not in categorical terms that are fitting into a diagnostic system, but in the more personal terms that show up when you know somebody from the inside out. Mm. Now, we sometimes socialize the junior clinicians out of that, and we teach them the long lists and the five out of nines and the four out of sevens, it's always 50% plus one. So there can always be some overlap, no matter how bad the diagnostic system is. But could we go back to where we started that we're genuinely curious about what empowers people and why it's so hard to be human? Mm -hmm. That's what brought us into the field. And what if the measures, the scientists, the concepts really took that seriously? Is it possible that it's actually simpler and the cacophony that we have of mm. how many different kinds of therapy for how many different kinds of syndromes and sub syndromes. And with you being said, you have to do it just like in the book, or you're not really doing evidence based care. I mean, your supervisor is trying to shame you into, you know, being Marshall Linehan. I mean, it, I don't know how to be Marshall Linehan or Steve Hayes or anyone else. I want to be myself as a clinician. And by the way, I see things in the session that I know aren't in the books. And I, F, things come up in my head that I know, and it actually happens when I use it. Don't tell anyone that I did. When I use this method for this kind of situation, it actually helps. Oh, and I see that there's cultural needs and there's religious backgrounds where I can't say it that way. If I say it that way, or if I do that thing or suggest that thing, I'm going to lose this person. Yeah, I could ride over them like some sort of domination, but no, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to have to talk about it in their terms. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they think about things very, very differently. They may even think that they're possessed or that I, you know, what exactly are their he heroes? How do I fit into their, you know, you start hearing things that you're told you should listen to, right? 
but you're not given the means to do it. You're supposed to be culturally sensitive. You're supposed to, you know, not, you know, violate people's uh, deepest values or their religious beliefs or, but we've adopted this top-down normative category, one size fits all protocol driven thing that turns people into fuzzy mm. error terms. How is that what we came to do? Now, I know it sounds hard, but actually I think it's going to be easier. And the reason is that I think clinicians themselves can begin to be themselves, but not in the way that that was done heretofore, where it's just like, it is good because it feels good. If you want to do that, it tears apart the discipline. True, because you're true. basically saying that grandma could be as good a therapist as you. as you, And when you do the studies... There's no evidence no. that experienced therapists are any better. So this is the devolution of a profession, not the building of a profession. So no, you need scientific knowledge. But the scientists need to simplify it in such a way that it can give in a way that empowers the people who use it. You know, if you're an architect, you don't know, need to know the details of complex physics. You call in an engineer if you need that and they work it out. But you do know something about how stress works on beams and, you know, how, how spans work and so forth. And so on. Well, in the same way, you can be an artistic therapist with guidance from geekier therapists, some of whom, I was the researchers, some of whom maybe aren't great therapists, but they know how to dig into the complexity of the human condition. And you move out of this one-size-fits-all, top-down normative categories. And you move into this world of uh, process-based uh, movements that are individual, but then are given nomothetic expressions because we can't do a psychology of every single individual, but only if they increase the precision of our ability to see the individual. We had to invent a term for it, Stefan, uh, Joe and I came up with the, the term idiomic, and it's the substitute for the word normal. And okay. we need an idiomic set of tools, measures, analyses that help you start with the individual, never treat them as an error term. And what you observe is locked down, but then add to it by seeing that there's patterns that occur across people. There are such a things as experiential avoiders, cognitive fusers. And when you learn to recognize it, that helps you see, just like knowing about reinforcement helps you ask the questions that lets you see some of what the reinforcers might be for a person. Once you get language, reinforcement is a lot harder to figure out because it's interacting with that. But All the time. So I'm really excited when I describe this and dig into it with clinicians, what you just said, which is a natural fear, turns into the excitement of maybe we could create a field where the researchers and the clinicians are on the same page. The unit of analysis is the same. And we feel as though we're in a partnership and not in a, some sort of hierarchical uh, um, you know, effort to dominate over practitioners because you have to, because the scientists said so. Well, it's interesting because that that initial space is, you know, one of fear because it, it, it questions what we're currently doing, a bit of an abandonment of that. So it says, if I take my shirt off, what have I got to cover myself yeah. uh, uh, with? You know, I'm being exposed, you know, but the the, the next level is is saying, wow, I'm being empowered and and asked to and given permission to also do what I know uh, is right from my experience in in you know looking at things functionally, looking at things within context with the lens of psychological flexibility, being able to see from different perspectives, you know pattern recognition. Yeah. Um, placing awareness on certain areas. And so it allows me to meet my, my, you know, client as they are in a, you know, uh, idiomormative way where the, you know, we're, we're dropping the categories yeah. and, and we see them as a human again, rather than, you know, them trying to, uh, uh, what's the right word, um, hijack the session and tell us what they have 
you know, I have this and and and, and we kind of get steamrolled and, and and move in that direction rather than saying, well, you know, I'll, well, I'll, you, I'll look you, after this space. You can feel the energy leave the room once that starts entering. And Can I use the example of an actual human being, a real individual person? Please. I don't know this person's name as part of a research study, but we did high density measures looking at processes of change that come out of the what we call the evolutionary meta model way of thinking about uh, psychological flexibility in its broadest sense. The part, the way of thinking that takes 80 some percent of everything we know, leaving only the um, biophysiological and uh, social cultural processes, but at the psychological level. Um, and so we've created measures that are not scales, they're like items that can tap into those. Uh, processes. The reason they're not scales is we don't make any a priority that they all fit together in one so coherent measure. Then it's not like that. There's no latent variable we're trying to model. No, we're just wanting questions that help us see what's going on for the person. Can you give a time. couple of examples of those? What those questions? Yeah, might I did. You know, let's say we're doing it uh, twice a day, and you know, I did things that uh, uh, gave me a place to express my emotions. You know, I did something in my life over the last several hours that gave me a place to express my emotions. Yeah, or probably. I did things that uh, tapped into a sense of personal importance. You know, okay, things like that. Now, if you're an acty person, you can kind of see sure. sort of the territory that we're exploring. Well, so we do this a couple times a day for a month. So we got 60 data points. Now we can model the individual without ever looking at another individual first, where you look within the person, you say, what leads to what? What predicts what? And you create a network and they loop back on themselves. And then you look to see, is anybody else in this population that I just did this with similar? And if the answer is, yeah, kind of, it looks like this over here is kind of a similar pattern. Then you say, well, okay, if I treat them as a group, do I see anything that I would have otherwise missed? I mean, it's all just done with formulas, but sure, I'm saying sure. Language, yeah. right. And you say, yeah, it looks like maybe this relationship, this edge, they call it in network theory, it wasn't quite enough to be significant for either one of them. But when I see them both together, I see this edge might have, might be there. Okay, well, let's try it. Let's put that edge into both individuals' models. Now let's remodel them as an individual. Do I account for more of the variance in what's going on in their life? It makes more sense. It fits together more. If the answer is yes for most people, okay, we'll keep it. If the answer is no, throw it out. So you see that's the sense in which the group becomes the error term. You only allow the group in, subgroups and overall group, if they increase the precision of seeing, I always use the metaphor of like wearing glasses, seeing the individual. Okay, then you keep it. And then it's the final step after all of that. You just keep doing it. You can't do it anymore, meeting the criteria for better fit and all of that. Uh, you remodel the individual now with everything in there that you've learned just from them, from subgroups, from overall groups, but only if they work from for most people. Now I'll model them. All right, so here's a human being. This person is unusual in their distress over sadness. They get wrapped around that issue. You might say, you probably would say, person gets depressed. But we're not going to do that because we're doing just even at the outcome measures, something that's more just descriptive, not diagnostic in a traditional, uh, you know, uh, a DSM way. When... This person gets distressed over sadness. What happens? Well, they withdraw from other people. Okay. They're less likely to reach out and seek out their friends and family and other people. What else happens? When they're less likely to reach out and so forth, they also have a sense that there's nothing important to do. Things start seeming meaningless. Okay. What else? When things start seeming meaningless, they start spacing out. They're not fully present with what's there inside and out in any given moment. They're not in contact with the present moment as enough. They're sort of mindless, you might say. Okay. When they go mindless and start spacing out, they start getting more distressed about sadness. Okay. This is depression, the person. 
you know, in the big meta analysis, a big, or excuse me, multi-site called the Star D trial, there were 3,700 and change so-called major depression disorders. How many combinations of signs and symptoms? More than a thousand. How many people had a combination that was so strange and usual, idiosyncratic and odd that only five or few others, about one one hundredth of the percent of the whole sample had that combination? Almost half. <laughs> so here we have this category, this ill-fitting suit that the book itself tells you isn't a guide to treatment. Read the DSM forward. It says it in words. This is not meant as a treatment guide. Okay. Now, you just heard me describe something that came out of ideographic longitudinal measurement put through these cool new statistical tools. The name for the tool in this case was called Group Iterative Multimodel Estimation, or GIMI. I won't go walk you through it, but it's really, really cool. And the person who helped develop it is working with us right now to help develop an app that will allow you to do this kind of thing in your practice. And we tend to give it away so that you'll be able to do it some for free. And then there's in-app purchases so you don't go bankrupt. But watch this space. But um, if you heard what I said, and you're a practicing clinician, and I said, you have to treat this person, and this is the only information you get, give me three options. I think 90% of the folks are going to say, well, maybe when you get distressed over sadness, you should reach out to people. Okay, well, how are you going to do that? Well, maybe there's skills training. Maybe the barriers are emotional. I'm going to be rejected. Maybe it's communication. I don't really know how to talk uh, to people about my feelings. Maybe it's alexithymia. I don't even, I don't know. We'll dig in a little more. But we'd do something sensible, wouldn't we? How about when I'm in that lonely space where I'm backing up from people and I'm avoiding being with people, I've lost a sense of what's imp what's important. What are you going to do about that, Mr. Clinician or Ms. Clinician? Mm, maybe we'll do values work or something. You probably wouldn't just say, I have no idea. You'd probably do something sensible. This particular client, it turns out that no longer not doing things that are important. There's another item of, I focused on what's personally important for me and that was not linked to those moments. What it was linked to is when they did that, they were more flexible in their behavior, but it wasn't linked to this. So I actually had, there were two other nodes in this overall network. So it was an easy peasy thing. If I show you the whole, the whole network, you'd say, well, of course, those values aren't linking over. Probably what it means is people are feeling like it's not quote unquote important, you know, it might, if you make it personally important, you know, mm. watering the flowers might be really important. So sue me if you don't like it. Um, flowers are of importance to me. I appreciate beauty. I'm doing it. Um, when the person stops sort of stepping up to these kind of uh, moments, these behavioral moments of doing things of importance, they space out. They're no longer in contact with the present moment. Well, it's not just the MBCT people who are going to say, mm, mindfulness training might be good here. Sure. Now, you've got three good options. They're all evidence-based for depression. But we're not treating major depression. We're, we're treating this client. And the protocols for major depression, there's many things that are not relevant to this client. Hmm. And maybe these things are in there too, but you're piling on session after session of things that don't really do what needs to be done. Why not just focus on what this person needs? And Absolutely. See if you, you know, I, I, I very direct, you know, approach that, you know, I, I think a, a lot of clinicians, at least their mind will, will, will bring it up immediately. will say something like, you know, behavior activation. You know, it's like, well, yeah, if, if we're looking at normative sort of space that someone being active, yeah, that probably does account for something, but it's not looking at the individual to go out and say, you know, who and what's important or, you know, what are the barriers to connecting with your loved ones that are, you know, important to you and, you know, what 
what what's getting in the way of you know the committed action to toward that uh, you know or, or yeah you know. this particular client that thing of when I withdraw I, I lose a sense of what's important behavioral activation might be helpful right there cool. in addition to the values conversation so there's all of these evidence based therapies are evidence based for a reason it means but you're somewhere looking in, for yeah, yeah. the <clears throat> set of networks out there called human beings we're complex networks you know we're biophysiological systems that are part of a culture we have a history we got well let's not ride over that and treat people as error terms good clinicians don't want to do that they want to really listen and hear and understand from the inside out but the scientists are actively getting in the way with categories and measures and and analytic tools that they then try to shame clinicians with that don't meet the real needs. So in area after area, when people are saying you're not appreciating the culture or you're not, boy, I look at it and I say, you know, they're right. The scientists yeah, screwed yeah. it up. <laughs> and and yeah, so you know, my, my, my apologies, yeah. I made a, a, an error with the behavior activation. I was in my mind thinking it's more about, you know, behavioral you know, uh, physical um, activity, which, you know, gets thrown around so much, you know, doing oh, yeah, some exercise yeah. or some nonsense when in actual fact, you know, behavior activation around, you know, who and what's important to you and, and so yeah, on. But all, it allows all, us all, to be clinicians I have to again. Yes, I have to say, because the data on behavioral activation are kind of impressive. Sometimes people will discover what they like just by getting going. But doing, yeah, so, doing like, anything. Yeah, yeah. Everything in place, you know, like people who socially withdraw. You know, you go to that bed, put up the covers. What's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day? It's different. You're going to find something different under the covers? My guess is no. And so, I don't know. I think it's it's more, we need more. But when you start thinking in this process-based way, you realize that almost every treatment out there that clinicians believe in has a corner of the truth. They've got elements in yes. there that are needed for some people sometimes. And they just don't have a way of saying exactly what is the person context interaction where that is what really what's needed. And wouldn't it be awesome if we had that? And we would have to maybe put down this kind of weird thing where I'm this kind of therapist and, oh, I'm that kind of therapist. And instead we could, you know, use what's needed for the person that we're serving. And yeah, you can put it in a model. You can have philosophy of science commitments. You can have, it's all good. You know, you don't, there can be different models, but, uh, but not in this weird kind of archipelago way where like you're committing a sin. If you visit another Island and, you know, you're betraying us because, mm -hmm. you know, we believe this and they believe that. And, I just was been having some exchanges with Peter Fonagy, you know, one of the best known psychoanalytic researchers on the planet. And it turns out he's actually following my work as I've been following his for years. I think it's cool. Mentalization is, makes perfect sense to me. And my psychoanalysts No, but do I want to know what good psychoanalytic work is going on that I could use to help somebody? You betcha, but not in a chicken gumbo, throw it all in a big pot. You know, everybody wins, everybody gets a prize way. No, in the way that it says, through science and good theory and a really careful focus on the needs of the individual, mm -hmm. can I open up my practice to a broad range of kernels and intervention methods within my model and my philosophy of science? I don't have to abandon that. That will empower me to serve the individual and not just demand that they like and get whatever I was trained in, uh, you know, back when I was a graduate student. Steve, to help me just try and and, and summarize this in my head, um, and I'm, I'm about to make an error, so I'm happy to put that forward. But uh, in 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 essence, is some of what you're saying with this process based therapy approach in that, uh, uh, irrespective of whether you're a you know air quotes act clinician. CBT clinician, schema therapist, whatever the modality is, the underlying data is is saying if we can step back from uh, these 
categories and, 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 and normative data and, and look at a more individualized approach that looks at uh, a functional analysis within a context, the context being the client, uh, while we you know, foster uh, uh, our, our uh, understanding of psychological flexibility and, and, and in actual fact, any of the uh, modalities are doing that, trying to see different perspectives uh, while we also then tap into what science is telling us, for example, you know, being connected with others you know, or being self-compassionate, but with the nuance of understanding that, you know, uh, one in five being self-compassionate is not functionally, uh, it doesn't provide the utility that we might want for them. So we, we're looking at it on an individualist, individual, individualistic basis. That That's this new space of process-based, and I, I've probably missed a lot, my apologies, but am I capturing this with that sort of summary Somewhat. You know, you, did, you didn't miss much, Nash, and I, I really, yeah, I would say the answer to that is yes, that's the that's the game. And uh, I think it's, it gives us a new way forward with evidence-based therapy that gets beyond the bad rap that evidence-based therapy has sometimes had from clinicians and clients mm. who really want to be seen as individuals and so forth. And it gives us a really new way forward in every area. You mentioned the, the psychological areas, and I agree with that. But there's also the, the social side of it, of being mm -hmm. able to, you know, extend. I, I like taking the psychological flexibility and extending them, you know, like uh, acceptance extends the compassion towards others or diffusion and cognitive flexibility to genuine conversations and, and uh, communication between people or values to joint values or action to cooperation and sense of self to attachment and uh, intimacy and uh, a sense of we. And so, you know, I think we have a coherent journey ahead of us at the, the biological level as well. It, diet, sleep, and exercise, of course, but also you know, medications have a role. They have a role. Let's, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you have a panic disorder person who's just walking into recovery. And you think that mm, beta blockers would be helpful, given the proper rationale. Tapered down. Why? Because the person's not going to be challenged as much by, you know, heart being 165 beats a minute and it can hardly breathe. And uh, you know, we will taper, we will reduce it. We're not going to stay. Oh, well, why not? Mm, mm. Done properly. Why not? I mean, this is even antidepressants, even tranquilize, uh, you know, anti so called anti anxiety drugs. All of those things might even have a role. And other things that are there in terms of helping our learning processes uh, physiologically uh, and, and things of that kind. So, all well, here, I'm not giving an answer. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. I'm saying all bets are off. Yeah, when yeah. we go this way, and let's let the data show us, but let's let the data be gathered in such a way that no human being is an error term, and every voice matters. We can actually do that. We have the tools conceptually, analytically, measurement-wise. And I just really, here's the, here's the thing. Either there's an infinite number of ways that people can get in trouble, in which case, if you open this door, you're going to sink into a morass of individuality that you'll never escape from, or what I think is far, far, far more likely what we're already seeing in our data. There are only so many ways to really get messed up as a human being. And it's actually simpler to focus on processes because they're immediately relevant. Clients love it. When you show them their own data, their own networks that they gave you, and you say like what I just said about that client, and I've done this now many times, people are like, wow, 
you're seeing in what do you have like radar eyes you're seeing into my life it's like the early days of the mmpi you know, i'm old enough to remember when you would show the profile people say oh my god you have a radar brain now you're just empirically repeating back what people said so our, our cultural conversation will be vastly more empowered i think destigmatizing but without these clown suits that we show you know demand that people wear and then Sometimes they can never take them off, you know. After all, you have to understand that I have, and then whatever the disorder is, and, and there's never a reset button. You know, sometimes that's for life. You know, I have this borderline personality disorder, whatever it is. Um, you know, I'm on the spectrum or whatever it is. Um, some things may be like that. People can be not neurotypical, for example, but I want evidence. Mm data and i want to make sure that our categories empower and don't uh, just categorize i i love that 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 idea of you know all bets are off because we're doing a functional analysis which which means we're, we're, we're looking at the individual having said that data is being collected that demonstrates that individuals aren't uh, so individual in that there are many individuals experiencing similar ways of being entangled uh, and that's what the clinician is here for, that we can observe uh, patterns and we, we can get hunches and understandings that are still informed by science, but it does require a bit of art, as, 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 as I think is reasonably uh, said, or, you know, we might use you know intuition or use the word experience, um, whatever the word is that, that, that fits. Uh, yeah, you used the magic words earlier, functional analysis. This is a new form of functional analysis that isn't just an art. It includes an art. You have to know enough artistically to, about con the person, processes that could apply to narrow it down, to actually test it. We're not going to test all possible processes for everybody. You'd overwhelm them. Over time, we might be able to do better because we may have easy things with wearables and so forth. I mean, you can easily get heart rate variability out of these uh, computers in your pocket. You can say something about vagal tone. You can look at sleep. You can, you know, you, you can put things into networks now that are ideographic uh, functional analyses, you'd say, uh, that doesn't have to all be to self-report. Or, But it's not everything. You're going to have to have, you know, a pretty good artistic and scientifically informed sense of how to begin a functional analysis and dial into what the person's goals are and what they really want from therapy. But then the scientists can help you instead of simply just um, telling you to do things that are not necessarily going to show up in better outcomes for people. I think enough of that. If they don't improve outcomes, if the measures don't have treatment utility, it's the word for what measures that help outcomes. I think I, I was one of the first to write about it long, long ago in 1986 in a paper that's still well cited. And we can really evaluate our concepts and our measures that way, functionally, then put them into functional analysis that pays off. Now, I have to say that I'm a little bit beyond the data. There are several studies, because there we actually get back to randomized trials. You really want a randomized trial where you do the tailoring and the functional fitting the way I'm talking, or you do a one-size-fits-all, do it the, the traditional way, um, a top-down uh, kind of uh, traditional diagnosis. Uh, there are studies kind of close to it. Uh, There's a good one from Aaron Fisher, for example. Uh, showing with the unified protocol that if you do a functional analysis linked to measures and then components drawn from the unified protocol, you get better outcomes than one size fits all. Everybody needs to get their unified protocol. Um, and, and that's one of several. So there's uh, breadcrumbs to follow. Sure. But I don't think we yet, uh, I have to really share with people that while everything I'm seeing tells me that this is a possibly powerful new way forward, and I I do know it's a new way forward. I, it is, now, that doesn't mean we'll have to see. So I don't want to run ahead and say we've got the solution, but boy, do we have an alternative that is, I think, has some really nice features that clinicians can resonate to 
you probably feel it just in this conversation. You know, this sounds kind of cool in a way if you if you can pull it off. So let's see. Let's mm-hmm. see. And Steve, that's that, that that's so beautiful to hear as well, because that's what a therapist should maintain, that we we you know are working with our client and we're you know, trying to understand the function, you know, the analysis of that, you know, we're exploring different positions and, and they're put to the test, you know, and, and, and then we have our client come back and we go, How did that go? What occurred? You know, what have your thoughts been since? What's your experience been like? And we, and, and we keep tweaking and, and you know, science is doing that. And, and, and you know, even for, for when you say unified sort of protocol, it, it, it warms my heart because I know just, you know, 500 meters from, from, from here uh, where I'm sitting, you know, the Australian National University is, is, is there and, uh, you know, they are teaching their students you know, uh, specifically a unified protocol as, as part of their curriculum. That's how it's being taught these days, which is brilliant and, and, and fantastic and warms my heart and hence why, you know, the caliber of, of uh, our, 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 you know, new clinicians coming out is, is fantastic. Let me just segue quickly because I know that we're we're um, uh, yeah. uh, running out a little bit of time, and and you've been so generous uh, so far. So thank you. But uh, I wanted to to also um, touch on because it, it it almost excites me. It's almost like the data that that you're collecting and from a, such a nuanced perspective, uh, uh, looking at it. In I think you use something about how detailed it is. Um, it almost seems to me or you know, triggers a, a thought in my mind about almost how AI is being used. And I know that I know that obviously data you know, is, is is complex, but the idea of AI to to understand, you know, things at a deeper level, it's resonating for for me that one day maybe your work and, and your your colleagues and the many, you know, students that that, that you look after, that this is going to accumulate to to um, you know, a space, you know, an app, uh, uh, you know, one day I'm sure, you know, some sort of uh, visual representation of a clinician that, that that can do some of our work or potentially, <laughs> you know, assist us, you know, and obviously I'm projecting very far forward because I love the tech world, but uh, uh, data is is becoming a new place to inform us. And I, I love to hear, I love hearing that it's, it's reaching psychology in a, in a genuine and real way. Yeah, I, you know, AI means a lot of things, but, uh, you know, big data machine learning AI, uh, you know, is coming and process based approach moves us forward. Some of the analytic methods that we're using, I'm used mentioned Gimme, but there's another one, a random forest procedure we've uh, worked uh, with just in the last month that really has opened up a whole bunch of new forms of uh, with a weird thing called a Baruta wrap, you know, that creates shadow variables. And uh, it's a machine learning kind of evolutionary algorithm that comes out of that larger space. And it's really doing a good job of helping us understand some of these uh, our clients where we have high density longitudinal data and looks like it'll run with uh, fewer than 60 data points, which uh, I mentioned, uh, Gimme uh, requires at least 60. But as we get larger data sets, we're going to be able to do this more and more. As we add wearables, we get larger and larger data sets. I'm president of a 45-year-old charitable organization called the Institute for Better Health. It's because I'm retiring at the end of this year from my uh, department, and I'm assuming that role. And we're deep into the developing an app that will do exactly what I've been talking about and determined to have it be available for free use for diagnostic purposes uh, at limited levels. And if you want big levels and stuff, you're going to pay for it and stuff like that. But uh, the big reason why we're really interested in it is to get enough data that we can then take advantage of some of the modeling uh, methods that are there that come out of AI and, uh, and sort of uh, big data uh, systems that may we'll see allow us to begin to have functional categories and not just topographical categories. You know, uh, if are there really the, the one I mentioned, you know, from, from withdrawing, nothing's important space out and, and sad. How common is that? Um, or something like it. And, and what do we want to call that constellation versus one that had a, another element in it? And, um, 
big data may, may give us a way of going. Some of the AI stuff is also driven by things that will, I, I think, give us a chance in another way. Uh, we're used to thinking about the possibility of wearables, let's say I mentioned heart rate variability or uh, social proximity. We have a recent study coming out of Andrew Gloucester's uh, lab. He's the president-elect of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, which is the ACT group uh, there in Switzerland. And, um, uh, uh, you know, An Andrew and Maria Krakola, who is the current president, together with some of their colleagues, showed that if you just put the tracker on your phone and follow around a pretty large representative sample of their Swiss uh, citizens and stuff, you could begin to make some statements about how likely that they would develop mental health problems, depression, and so forth, just by tracking their movements. Wow. And so I think, okay, well, what else could we add? Well, you're looking here at a relational frame theorist. I mean, I've spent a lot of my life trying to figure out what what language and cognition is and made the claim that it's relational learning, not associative learning, which almost everybody out there in psychology tried to make associative models work. 300 years of that, we never did a very good job of it. But the relational models are now really starting to catch on, not just in behavior analysis or behavioral stuff, but also in hard cognitive science, you're starting to see a drumbeat. And we're able to do things with raising IQ and helping people solve problems better and so forth. And not just that, we have some studies showing if you score the natural language of clients in sessions two and three, you can predict what's going to happen for them at a follow-up. And you can see their avoidance patterns. You can see their fusion patterns right there in the words they pick. Now, wouldn't it be cool if you could simply get permission, turn on the mic, I mean, you already have a thing. Heck, if we're doing this in the right, we're doing this in Zoom. If you had the right level account, we could push a button and get a transcript. You know, in about ten minutes, it would give us our transcript, and it's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. well, that, that can be scored. We can put that through these big data AI style natural language processing things, maybe driven by some theory like relational frame theory and psychological flexibility. So that we could detect what are the kind of words you use when you're using comparatives of yourself to others or when you're fused with something or when you're so, for example, we, we showed actual mediation, a functionally important pathway of change with the treatment of uh, ACT for tinnitus. I say that we, it was uh, uh, Gerhard Andersen's crew in uh, Sweden and myself. When people started saying things like, well, I have the thought that I, or, well, I'm noticing that I, well, I have the feeling that I, that was a marker for something really important happening. And it happened like in session two and three. And if it didn't happen, that was a worry. Yeah. And it, you know, it's just the beginning. It's the nose under the tent of something that could be massively more if we had big enough data systems and use them properly. Now, there was a problem there, which is, uh, Google no longer says do no evil as one of their things because it's a joke. And they know that at the level of a you know big commercial enterprise like that, they can't avoid doing evil. So I've spent two years actually in this not-for-profit I'm involved with of how to balance the science issues, the for-profit issues. You got to make money enough to keep going, the not-for-profit issues. And, you know, the, the data are going to, the long-term data are housed in such a way that if you broke into it, you'd never have a chance of knowing who those people are. Sci it'll be open in the sense that science can get to it, but they can't go to the data directly. They have to make queries that's filtered by a science board. You know, it's complicated. And when we get a big enough data set to really make it worthwhile, I think it's going to be real important for the world scientifically. But if we don't do it, others will, probably many people will, but my point just being, if we thoughtfully arrange a world in which it's safe to collect enough of the kind of information that's process focused so that we can do what we started to do in the earliest days of behavior therapy, but now at the level where all the processes can play. If you're Peter Fonagy and you want to put mentalization in there, great. Give me the measure or help me figure out how to extract it out of the transcripts. You know, let's all hands on deck. You know, everybody's ideas are welcome. And let's figure out, 
can we really begin to model at the level of the individual what it's like to prosper or what it's like uh, to get in your own way and begin to answer that question of why it's so hard to be human and what to do about it. And big data, AI, you know, is going to be part of it. I hope it's not part of it in such a way that it's secretly funded behind the scenes by big pharma and people who want to sell your products. Please don't do it that way. Please, please, please. Can't somebody see this coming? And instead, let's create a, a way of doing it that protects the interests and rights and ethics and culture of humanity while at the same time bringing our best science to bear. Steve, I, uh, I have such goosebumps and, and hope, you know, hearing you speak about, about this and, and, you know, how much further this can help us as, as clinicians. And, and, you know, I hope you can also be a part of that conversation to make sure that it remains safe or, or it starts as a, as a safe and, um, you know, an endeavor that, that that's for the people, um, not for profit and, and not suggesting that organizations don't need profit. They need lots of it to continue doing good science and research, but that the underpinnings, the morals, the ethics, the that humanity is at the forefront. Um, so I hope, I hope that goes well. I'm, I'm going to segue to a very strange question that we, we, we touched on before, um, okay. that I did want to get your take on before we finish up, uh, today, um, which was really to talk about, uh, just briefly about, we, we touched on obviously medication, uh, uh, and we also spoke about, you know, all bets are off. And I wanted to talk, get your views on psilocybin as, as, you know, some of the research that's, that's, that's coming out. So I know it's completely different, but, uh, I wanted to squeeze it in oh, before we finish oh, up. Um, I love the, I love the topic and I think it's really, really important. And there's an example. The reason why, sorry, Steve, to, to jump in. Yeah. The reason why I, I raise it is, is uh, I've read about it. You know, I've, I've, I've listened to some, some, uh, you know, uh good, good, uh, um, persons in that space who, who talk about it. And, it seems to me that there's something about, you know, whether it's a psilocybin or an ayahuasca or some some other drug, whatever it is, um, that there's something about it creates a vulnerability or a psychological flexibility and, and a sense of openness. And, and I know the language is always difficult to understand, hence why I'm, I wanted to ask you um, about that, because it sounds like there's something there and, you know, that there's research within the PTSD world. I, I you know, and obviously here I'm categorizing again, um, uh, but there, there's research which, which is showing that there is you know, a real functional value in, in a short period of time, potentially, if it's done exceptionally well, like, you know, a lot of setup required before the actual psilocybin set up and obviously lots of unpacking uh, afterwards. But I wanted to hear your views. Well, you know, ACT is a part of the psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy movement that's used by many teams as are other things, but it's it's in there because the, the fit is so good. And some of our measures of psychological flexibility processes, we know move uh, with it. And the measures that are specific, you know, oceanic awareness and, and these kind of spiritual experiences people have, even the underlying neurobiological evidence. I wrote an article that's summarizing some of what we know about what happens in underlying neurobiology with uh, psychedelic um, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. And it fits the psychological flexibility model really, really well. Uh, if you take something like oceanic awareness, you have this, this sense of um, uh, unity uh, uh, across time, place, and person. Uh, you know, a, a sort of sense of timelessness, spacelessness, or, or expansive uh, quality of space. And, you know, everyone, everywhere, uh, all the time. Um isn't there a movie kind of like that movie, that name? There is, and a good one. But um, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, people who have spiritual experiences, and not all do, but if they do, that's one of the mediators of positive outcomes of psychedelic uh, uh, therapy. And it's uh, built right into the very first steps in ACT, the first act article ever written on ACT was called Make Sense of Spirituality, and it was an attempt to unpack the uh, spiritual experience, I think you'd say, that I had at the bottom of my panic disorder. And um, 
and basically saying it was published in the journal behaviorism. It was written in a very behavior analytic tight way, but it's basically saying we cannot look away from this. This is important. Don't just be calling it mentalistic or some nonsense. This is a human experience. And a vast majority of human beings know what you're talking about when you talk about it in that way. The cool thing about the psychedelics is now we may be able to get to look at these processes psychologically and neurobiologically reliably because we can produce them in the lab, in the clinic at sufficient density that we can catch them in flight and um, be able to understand a bit more about what they are. We know that one of the things happen is some of the midbrain structures that are dominated by your narrative sense of self, which filters out sensory and sensory motor information literally making it almost impossible to know the world you live in because you're living inside a category mm -hmm. and your brain never gets access to the actual information about what's going on in your life because it's being filtered out because it doesn't fit the story. Yeah. Well, you blow up those gatekeepers, you know, and now you're in a whole different world where, uh, you know, there's this kind of flood of new information. And without that kind of narrative sense of self blocking it out, um, it gives you a chance to push the reset button around questions like, who am I anyway? And what do I really want in my life? And not in a mindy, you know, judge it and think it out way, but in this very experiential in the moment, open up Experience wiser way. self as content. Right, that there, there, there's something in that, right? It blows away the selfless content, and you and you catch that you've been there all along. This self as context feature, this more spiritual part of you, yeah, has been there since you ever were conscious, but you haven't been noticing because it doesn't have edges. You're never conscious of the edges of consciousness. You can't be. So there's something in your experience that is everywhere always and all the time which is what awareness so far as you're aware and people sometimes say as far as i know i'm everywhere all the time well yeah because and now we believe that we have limits and we can see that our physical form has limits and all that kind of stuff but there's this kernel of experience that doesn't have limits that we can experience uh that way which is what I think, uh, well, in that article that I wrote in 1984, I, you know, where I said, this is the platform on which, because uh, I wrote a piece kind of analyzing this, and I say, well, why would it matter? And I say, because well, this is the platform on which you can put your past pains and still be wise and learn from them. You don't have to run. You don't have to cling. You can notice and learn and come back to the present. You know, this is the place where you connect in consciousness with others. When your eyes met, you see the humanity of the other person and you see the we that is there between you. So sometimes so thoroughly even that you blend in a healthy way, in the way that uh, in trips, sometimes you really do feel as though you're part of everyone and that you're everywhere and that it's timeless. Uh, and there's other processes. Your values show up. You make values choices very often. And psychedelic therapy, you realize you've been chasing things that are very mindy and judgmental, and it really is not what you want to do. That sense of wholeness gives you the power to do that. And um, you you look at the big impact on trauma. Mm. Well, the trauma studies are gobsmacking. And it's not the chemicals alone that are doing this. Um uh, I don't think the I don't like the microdosing studies as much, and there's a recent one showing that maybe it's just uh, more uh, expectations. But the but the the double dose or whatever ones that where you really have an opportunity to open up a space you've never opened before. Once you see it, you can never unsee it. You know, once you feel it, you sense it, you're with it. That will never be forgotten. It's always part of you. Now, you can turn it into a precious stone in the box, and you're saying, oh, this moment's not like that moment. I saw that train wreck. I lived through it. Mm -hmm. I sat on Hippie Hill in the summer of love. You want to chase that experience? It's going to mock you. It because fusion again. Yeah, yeah. And you're right into that fuse comparison. Oh, this is not good enough. That last trip was better. I need to yeah. take more. Oh, please make it stop. 
I know where that leads. It mm. leads to death. It leads to disability. It leads to people lying in the street next to needles with dog poop next to them. I mean, in two years, Summer of Love turned into a tragedy. No wonder it was back to the land. We were running away from what we'd created. But we, I have to say a we, because it was a little bit my generation, <laughs> created it out of love and out of conviction that there was something profound to be earned and learned by opening up to human experience. And it wasn't party, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That was reporters writing bullshit. That's not what that was. It was the hip, the yippies showing up and giving away free food and laughing about us. They went back home. I mean, it was, what would the world be like? If we took what's inside some of these experiences and we put them into our culture, we put them into our moments, we put them into our families and communities. And, and yeah, it turned into party and get high and we paid the price for it. And we've been through a repressive gen set of decades because of it. So let's do it right, gang. Mm. Well, this and is the functional the analysis. Yeah, don't be the mushrooms talk to you. The mushrooms aren't talking. <laughs> But done with the proper set, this is an ally and an aid that we can turn into a creating a more loving world if if we learn how to manage it and use it. And so I'm uh, I'm you know part of a couple of uh, recent conferences on psychedelic uh, assisted therapy, and I'm cooperating with teams around the world to help them uh, measure and dial in. The thing, and, and I've looked at some of the data, excuse me for going on so long, but we've done some stuff where we look at high density longitudinal measures of psychological flexibility of people who are uh, going through a, a, an organized multi session use of psychedelics as part of a helpful uh, process. And we can see the psychological flexibility growing in people, we can see these shifts happening. And people showing up in a way that's more mindful, more aware, uh, more values-based, more uh, compassionate and uh, connected. And, you know, you can see wholeness show up. I think there's something that, that fascinates me by it because it almost feels like it, 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 it can be so from my reading so transformational and I know that when I go camping for example and I just sit in the forest and you know, make sure that it's just me sitting with the earth and the moment it you know so much of that connectedness you know floods in and, and I can only imagine that's still within my gatekeepers of the narrative you know that you know so so only such a small amount or you know, my connection with my daughters when they were born and, 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 and that there was, there was only one thing happening. That was me holding my, my precious and beautiful and gorgeous, you know, offspring. And, and there, there's this time of but they're, they're so fleeting. And, and, and it seems to me that sometimes a psychological flexibility and shift that we would desire for our fellow humans um if there's a way to assist that you know in a way that's sticky if i can use that language um you know is, is that, that that's profound and and you know um i haven't done you know i'm not a researcher and i haven't done my research you know but it sounds like there's the the beginnings of a conversation that says that there's something really sticky about this and if it's if it's done in an extremely functional and and and, and considered way um, can be an incredible ally for, for mental health. And what we may be able to do is keep people the guides of some of ways of putting some of the space into the habits that you deploy so it becomes sticky in an additional way. And it's so intense and clear at the time that it becomes sticky that way. But if you can put it into your life's moments, mm. you know, this is why a practice of mindfulness is so helpful. The practice can't be constantly taking psychedelics, that's not the practice. The practice has to be to put what you saw there into your life's moments. And psychological flexibility can help. And if I can say one little thing, you know, because people talk about this kind of, uh, oh, I don't know, the epistemic uh, dominance of randomized controlled trials and so forth over indigenous peoples who, after all, came up with a lot of these uh, plants and we found them and used them and so forth. 
And I do think we have to be careful about coming in with our big mud boots and randomized trials and saying, we're going to just do it our way. Um, and some of what I've been saying in this time with you is uh, trying to focus on a kind of science that I think will allow us to speak across cultural divides and bring them together because all cultures influence each other. That's how cultures evolve. And so it's not a matter of cultural appropriation or whatever, but when you, in a crude form, no, it's cultural influence, but it has to be mutual and respectful. And so I really do, I'm really and interested in what the wisdom traditions, the spiritual traditions have learned and how they've used some of these uh, transformational technologies that come mostly from plants and so forth that have been in the human community for a long time that are called psychedelics. And yes, do I want to bring, you know, analytic measured science into it? Yes. But I don't want to do it in a way that, that diminishes the individual human being in any way. And so some of the ways that I've been talking here, I think will get a much better uh, reception. I mean, if you're a Native American and, and you know that this has been used in a particular way, if I really listen to what you're saying and I ask, well, how can that be measured? And can I ask those questions? Where would I see that? And and model that in a way that does gives proper attention, gives due weight to that. Well, then I'm learning from other cultures. I'm not dominating over the cultures by doing that. If I come in and just say, no, no, it's double blind. We're doing a randomized trial. You know, the, the chemical is the only thing that matters. Uh, excuse me, I think you are doing violence. It's not fair because you're really not listening to the individuals. Plus, I have to say, some of the categories you're using came out of the same space that led to mass sterilization programs for Native Americans. Do you know how many Native Americans were sterilized? Because they didn't meet the categories of, you know, IQ or whatever that, you know, white people put on them. I mean, they were lied to and treated horribly. And so science has dirty hands because of its dirty history and behavioral science, especially. I mean, IQ has been used as a weapon as to who is uh, deserving of life even. I mean, of course, in Germany, it literally became that. It would just, before, and I'm, I'm Jewish by the maternal line, I can say this, but before the Jews were dying, people who had mental deficiencies or anxiety problems or depression were dying, schizophrenia, they were dying. They were being given overdoses as part of the T4 program in hospitals and false letters were written to their family about how they died when actually they were killed by the nurses who had a list of who would die each night. So, and why did that come out? Because you could measure their IQ and they're on the wrong level. You could measure it. You know, so some of these same tools, you know, when I start looking at, I mean, I sniff, what we do sometimes in categorizing people instead of measuring and empowering people. And boy, I smell the stench of eugenics. The statistics started there and they're still used that way. So a little thing about the cultural concerns about psychedelics. Let's not go in there with big mud boots on thinking that, you know, you know, the, the white Western scientific randomized trial world is the way to do good psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. I've just spent almost two hours talking to you about how there's a really different way that is better science, that is statistically and mathematically not invalid in the ways that those other methods are. And I think that will allow us to be allies, be cultural allies, if you come in with the science values uh, and and not uh, ride over uh, the cultures that, after all, uh, first showed us that these uh, may be helpful to mm -hmm. human development. Steve, I admire you so much, and and I thank you for your your generous time and and your your life's work. I. I um, genuinely feel you know in, in awe speaking to you because i think your contributions and and that of your your peers as well you know the the way that you can 
approach human beings and, and this work that we talk about today with process-based therapy of meeting humans as they are as, as, as humans not as labels or categories is so inspiring and I thank you for your generosity and coming back on the show and uh, I, uh, I hope that you know we can meet again one day and get you back and and, and continue this yeah, conversation. Yeah, I'll come back it's, a third, it's, it's, it's a third time. And can I just say, if people want to follow my work, uh, go to uh, stephenchayes.com, click on Yes, Please Send It To Me. I'll put you on the newsletter list. I don't spam people. It's a one-click opt-out. And so if something in here, and conversely, if something in here sort of resonates in some way and you want to pursue it, you know, Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, or just Google, you'll find so many free resources that help you learn about ACT and, psych- and the psychological flexibility, process-based approach, or process-based therapy. And so our intent is to give it away and empower clinicians to use this in the interests of the lives of those they serve. We're not trying to build castles in the sky. And if you want to be part of that, or just benefit from that, uh, we really that, want to serve you in that way. So uh, we're interested in your vo- voice and uh, come hang out with us. And I vouch for that as well. You won't be spammed. It's great material and and, and all the uh, information that you provide is, is, you know, exceptional and, and, you know, whether it's liberated mind, your personal books or the uh, you know, different online courses that you have now and you know, your associations with other other uh, associations, ACBS and the like, um, you know, great people doing great work and, and uh, you know, it's, it, it's also a pleasure to be part of that as well. So thanks again, Stephen. Really, really appreciate your, your time today. Thank you so much, Ned. Great spending time with you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.